Hello, welcome to the 12th edition of um, AirHex. I think we have one whole year, so thank you for watching. And um, so let's start with the questions. We have lots of questions, so uh, start with the first. HTTP, um, and the first one is about um, HTTP session replication and clustering, is uh, asked by Piotrek. And um, uh, he asked me uh, um, how to s replicate a session and, and clustering in Java e context. And I think I mentioned it several times. So in my opinion, um, session replication um, is actually not needed in Java e context. And why this? What, um, how it usually works is um, you have multiple uh, servers and uh, the, each server maintains the hash map and the hash map is actually the HTTP session. So it looks like a hash map. And uh, behind the scenes, the session is replicated between the nodes. So what it actually means is um, the session is replicated asynchronously. So um, what it uh, what it uh, what it means, of course, asynchronously, it means um, the data can get lost. And if you synchronize um, um, uh, in synchronous way or replicate the data in synchronous way, it usually does not scale, scale very well. So you have to choose between consistency or uh, or scalability, as always. And uh, usually, um, uh, f who cares about HTTP session, right? So in worst case, the user will have to relog in to the application again. So usually, you don't need session replication. Uh, session affinity is just just enough, and uh, you shouldn't store anything important in the session. So um, if you would like to store something really valuable, you should store it in the database. So um, the next question. Um, uh, someone asked me, so why I'm so against uh, SOAP? And um, actually, um, I'm not against SOAP, but if you if you look at the SOAP, so what I did, I tried to find the um, uh, SOAP specification and to, uh, to show you the recent one. So we have here, I will have to find the right one. Uh, there was uh, this one. And the recent one is actually four years old, and it was um, it was not even uh, uh, not even updated for 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 several years. So uh, for four years, and no one is talking about soap on conferences anymore, blog posts, uh, books. So it's uh, pretty quiet. And um, from the uh, technical perspective, I would say um, JAXRS and REST is um, superb i would say um, over soap if, if you if you look at the soap protocol it is basically an xml message uh, wrapped with an envelope and um, it is it is a servlet which expects um, uh, post messages and this is basically soap and the sad story is soap is not really that interoperable so um you get some trouble between you know java and .NET and and uh, even if you would like to communicate between Java and, 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 and how it's called Internet of Things, it is really challenging. And uh, this is why I don't talk a soap um, a lot. It's just it's, for, for me, soap is fading away. And even in really large projects right now, we don't use soap anymore. We use JAXRS exclusively. This is why I'm not against soap. So for instance, I really like Corba. So I think if, if we would update the Corba API, it would be a great efficient protocol, but I still, but it don't use it anymore because, you know, it also fades away. So, um, so this is my opinion about SOAP. And I have to admit, I personally never liked SOAP because it was sold as a, um, I would say business API. It was never used that way. It was misused um, as a uh, remote procedure call protocol. And, uh, and in, uh, if you are using JAXRS, you cannot misuse it um, um, so, so easy because everyone would see the misuse in the URI and with SOAP it was really very uh, it was very convenient to hide to uh, to hide behind the uh, visible and yeah this is why my, my personal opinion about SOAP so um really I think I didn't use SOAP for I don't know eight years or something so um 2006 2007 in projects sometimes of course I've uh, consumed SOAP messages and then I generate a stop with visible gen, but I don't use it um, um, actively, or I don't don't like to introduce SOAP services in, in in new projects. And for me, this is also a little bit too complicated. Too complicated to test, to debug. You need for stress test specific tools. You need SOAP UI. So it is like too much overhead. So it um, is not compatible with the lightweight nature of Java E. So um, 
So um, the next question is interesting. Can two um, uh, modules communicate with each other through local interface in the same app server or JVM? And uh, the same app server or JVM, yes, but uh, within the war, for instance, or between EJB jars in the same year, is this very possible? What uh, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't communicate between, uh, or, or it's actually not meant to communicate between years or wars because uh, then the isolation of applications were uh, violated. So what's the point having two years communicated over binary protocols? Then you can put everything one one year. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, the communication is even improved, was even improved with um, with EJB 3.2. So I will just try to find it. So there should be um, uh, 3.2 specification. And what I found, this is the chapter uh, global JNDI namespace. If you look, the uh, JNDI names were standardized. So what you can now easily do, and it's very easy to locate the EJBs, as you can see, the um, the name comprises the Java global slash uh, archive name and bin name. So this bin obviously doesn't have any uh, interface. It's just uh, the um, uh, local view and um, after the excl exclamation mark, you can you can uh, specify uh, the interfaces, local or, or remote interfaces. So um, so this is again this is the um, the uh, module name, and uh, this is app in within the app a name. So um, absolutely possible. And look at the EGB32 spec and the global JNDI names m make it even um, um, more possible. I don't do this. What, what I'm a big fan of is putting everything to a war. We have, we will have a question soon about, you know, uh, monolithic and uh, and microservice architectures. So, uh, in my point of view, you should create a monolith thir first, which is easy to use, a war, and then uh, if you have um, more requirements or multiple teams, what you could do then, then you can introduce uh, more wars which are communicating with each other. So this was, this would be my. Um, my basic idea how to um, uh, how to structure the applications so um, the next point um, what is the uh, most elegant way of implementing simple single table multi-tenancy with discriminator column in JPA2 without using provider specific um, features so the problem is uh, multi-tenancy was supposed to come to Java 7 but it didn't made to the spec so um, Java 7 was supposed to be all about clouds, but um, I would say um, at the um, towards the end uh, of the um, of this pack, they decided not to do so. So um, Hibernate and Eclipse Link are are providing multi-tenancy, but the, the multi-tenancy is not exposed via official JPA APIs. So uh, now we have the paradox situation where you can actually be multi-tenant, but not over JPA um, JPA standards, but all providers behave similarly. And uh, Eclipse Link is doing this. Um, Hibernate, you can achieve something with um, Hibernate filters, I think. And inverse, so the portable way would be to enhance the um, the name queries. So what you could do, you can you know enhance the name query with where tenant ID whatever. And with Java 7, you can even create name queries on the fly. So you can load them from I don't know <laughs> even from database or from whatever. Um, this is what you could do. So this is a manual way of doing this. So each query needs to be enhanced with the tenant. What we also did, it is even go a step further in a project. You can select the um, whole entity manager depending on something. So um, if you, for instance, specify a JAXRS token, so depending on the token, you can use producers, CDI producers to select the right entity manager. So this is also a way to implement this. So we actually did in the current project. So depending on uh, the user ID, um, we were able to connect with different entity managers, depending on country and whatever. So this is, and then you can of course switch everything, right? But this is not what the question is about. The question is about single table multi-tenancy. So it means the it's very like, very similar to uh, a single table inheritance. It's the same, it's actually the same story. Okay, um, then then there is, uh, um, and the scenario is actually with the token is what I explained right now, what you could do depending on the token, you can select the context using CDI on the fly. This actually, Works really well. I think I even recorded some some uh, screencasts, or at least I described it in my blog. If not, I can record it. So it's very, very, very nice. What you can do, you can inject an instance of something, 
and um, and pass the qualifier and a qualifier and select on the fly whatever you like. For instance, the entity manager or or even more. Um, so the, the the question number six: Do we need to propagate the security context? Does the subject uh, principles to EJB if using form based authentication? You 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 don't never have to do this. And this is actually based on um, on the servlets protocol. So um, this is the authentication of servlets. And what happens here um, um, is also, um, 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 let's say, servlets are based for everything. So servlets are the base of uh, SOAP, JAXRS, GSF, struts, and whatever. And what servlets um, um, uh, provide you is the basic uh, authentication. This is this base 64 encoding. Digest um, is a little bit more... Uh, secure, but not really. So it's just you know the uh, the hash is is passed back and forth. The HTTP client authentication is certificate. This works, but is very um, um, hard to maintain because you will have to distribute the certificates and the form based authentication is what is asked for right now. And but, but by the way, this is ancient. There's nothing new here. I think this was the um, not. I think it is actually from the beginning of the servlet spec. So even Java Web Server could provide this, and this is actually how how the internet works. And uh, the form-based authentication is a little bit more special. What it actually means, you have to, to prepare a form. I think the name of the form is like J underscore form or whatever, J username and J password. And the interesting story, what we actually did in project, you can use even this for JAXRS. So if you know the names of the form or whatever, you can pass with JAXRS a, a, a um, what is called um, WW form encoded request to the to the backend, and uh, the principle is still going to be passed to EBGB. So the, the the answer is you never have to pass the principle if you authenticate yourself using servlets, JSF, or whatever. Everything is passed to EGBs. Okay. So um, and the next question is: Isn't it better or almost easier to use custom annotation interceptors to implement a permission-based security? Um, as opposed to the container's role-based security. And I think you need both. So you need authentication and authorization. And authentication uh, would mean um, uh, you get the principle, and uh, usually there, there are... Um, they are... Um, 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 how it's called realms you have to use um, from from your from your clients so you know it could be LDAP it could be a database usually it's a data, uh, LDAP or database or or something something else and this and these realms are usually used uh, for authentication and then you get the principal the principal name and if you have the name you can you can then go to your realm or your store and fetch the permissions whatever you like. And I actually wrote a free article about this. If you search for Adam Bean uh, authorization article or whatever uh, article, it was with Glassfish and with examples. It's actually, what I implemented. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you um, uh, if you if you if you search for this, you will find a free article that you can you can use the ideas there to. Um, to uh to to implement this is what I exa exactly what I did I started with the basics and, and and assumed okay this is not sufficient and then I implemented interceptors and annotations to show you um, what you can do without any external framework but um, I wouldn't I don't do it always you know is it just if you have specific requirements or or we need a very uh, I would say very flexible permission model okay so. Um, would ja um, JASPIC server authentication module Sam fit in this scenario? It could, and I actually wanted to prepare a small example about Sam, but um, what I what I what I did instead, I um, I uh, found an example, and I will show you this in a second. So. And um, and um, if you search for Jaspic and Glassfish, you will find you will find a um, a Glassfish 3.0 example. So um, wait a second. Uh, it was called Glassfish 
just pick um, and the question was server authentication module this is this link and um, if you if you go further you will find an example source code example how to implement um, a whole uh, example using um, glassfish uh, three orders one was web logic and the other one was um, uh, with uh, glassfish uh, glassfish 30 uh, even and uh, usually you could uh, you you could use sam or server authentication module um, to do something special like for instance um, you could um, as uh, mentions here use the token and uh, use the token for authentication but if you are using form based authentication or, or base 64 um, using HTTPS it, it would be sufficient so you don't need you know to implement SAM for this so SAM would be if you have no control over the tokens or the API then you can use a custom module which extracts the information from the from the request and 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 use it for for authentication but then you can do whatever you like so easier i wouldn't say easier it's more flexible then you can do whatever you like um i actually implemented this a very few times the same and usually i rely on the base 64 authentication and sometimes from base which is exception from the rule base 64 with uh, ssl is just works just fine um so i think i hope the question is answered um i just cannot launch the um editor for unknown reasons it's just um kind of launch it so um um so the next question is a single timer event um of egb timers in a distributed application so uh the question is uh, my understanding of the question is we have a cluster and uh the, the application is distributed over uh, multiple nodes and um and uh what uh, what is uh needed is that the time timer is fired once per whole cluster and um, this is very easy to achieve. What you have to do, uh, the default uh, schedule, so timer is the schedule annotation, or you can use uh, timer out of the box. And uh, the uh, schedule annotation means if you're using um, uh, persistence equals true, if the timer is persistent, it stores the information somewhere. And in the event of Glassfish, uh, for instance, you can specify the table where the timer information is stored. And if the table is global or shared, you, you you can uh, you you get this so the timer will fire once per cluster um if you're using uh, transient timers instead then will fire once per node so the next question is what do i think about gradle and um i mean this is a, a really hard question so what i think about uh, gradle so what i did instead so instead i I, sh I created an application a java application which is buildable buildable with uh with maven and with gradle so um this is the default um maven so what you see is we have the group id artifact id version number um we packaging war we have one dependency which is java e api um this is optional but i like to do this so now the name of the war is predictable so it's maven versus gradle dot war and not a uh, version number and then some optional properties like um we, we like to use jdk 1.8 and uh, we don't need WebXML. And in the event of Gradle, this is the Gradle script. So as you can see, it's exactly the same information. So what I just did, uh, did I created a, um, a variable, which is used here. And this is exactly the same uh, using Gradle. And so actually from this point of view, it does not matter. Um, I have to admit most of my Java 7 applications look like this with more test dependencies. So there is there are no usually no specific plugins, and if so, uh, is a plugins like a no visualization plugin, or um, what else? Uh, yeah, visualization plugin. This is a Visual E what I use sometimes, and then it's just straight. You don't need anything else in typical Java Java seven Java six project, and uh, Gradle is more flexible. But I usually don't need the flexibility in straight Java e project. But what you could use with Gradle, for instance, you can. Um, uh, replace grunt for instance or um, gulp with gradle because it's more powerful it's actually a programming language and maven is not a programming language so in straight java e projects i always use maven and not uh, gradle so what i um what i can do i would just open the um i would like just to open the uh, terminal 
wherever the terminal is. So something strange is going on. So, and so what we can do right now is the following maven clean install. So it was created in uh, 0 0.7 seconds and with Gradle we can build it as well. It looks a little bit different, more interesting probably. So it built in two seconds. So we could argue Maven is, uh, Gradle is three times slower than, than Maven is, of course, doesn't matter here. So um, this is, so again, this is Gradle. And we have a, a build with Maven. So whatever you use is fast. Gradle is more powerful, and I would argue Maven is simpler for Java 7. And uh, if your project is not Java 7 and you need more complex, uh, I don't know, continuous integration pipelines, whatever, you can use Gradle. I usually use uh, um, uh, Nason or Shell Scripting or, or Bash or Jenkins actually for pipelining, not Gradle and not Gradle. So um, I would say if you don't have specific requirements, I would use Maven. If you have uh, crazy uh, build requirements, use Gradle. This was this was uh, uh, my, um, I hope, objective answer. Um, so with Java 8 in streams, you do not really get how, uh, I do not really get how the exception handling is working. So this is the question number um, 10. And uh, yes, uh, the functions cannot throw checked exception, so it is just impossible with uh, lambdas. So what you what, what you can do is you can you can inherit from functional interfaces and um, you know and and throw your own um, runtime exception, for instance, convert to runtime exceptions, and um, then you you just get the exception. But if you would like to pipeline, you know, the chunks of functionality. I would use a completable, fu uh, f completable future, yes, um, I recorded also a podcast about this, completable future is the name of the podcast, uh, screencast, sorry, and uh, then you get um, a method um, handle, do handle exception, on exceptionally, so then you can react to exceptions actually, so you can say, uh, say if exception happens, then return this, so, um, so in default case, um, Checked exceptions are not possible, and runtime exception will just stop the pipeline. But if you would like to react to the exception, uh, to exceptions, use completable future. So um, I get funny tweet: um, um, a Java seven application is not working, and uh, what what I should do? And what happened was um, what I understood is a uh, bin XML was forgotten, and there is a different behavior between Java six and Java seven. So if you have Java 6 application, uh, it is only uh, it is sufficient to have bins XML. And if you get bins XML, dependency injection is working everywhere. In Java 7, if you have just bins XML, you get the default that only annotated bins are injectable. So this is what, what I always do. I put in bins XML all. I do it in all these screencasts. So just watch some screencasts of me, you will see this. And and then with uh, in Java 7, bin XML, XML with all is the same as uh, in Java 6, Java 6 bin XML empty. So um, question number 12, can we set scheduler, scheduler time from some property file or so? Of course, and even this is a very um, time uh, configurable, very old blog post from me. I don't know how old it is, but um, um, simple as possible timer, and there is um, there was one additional blog post about configurable timer. Uh, Probably too old. So, and the main difference is, um, as you can see, you can inject the timer service. And if you have the timer service, you can create the uh, timers on the fly. And I'm actually actively using this in Lightfish. In the Lightfish application, you can, you can uh, stop create uh, timers on the fly uh, with the text box. If you enter the text box, the, uh, the um, 
the, 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 the schedule changes when Lightfish fetches the monitoring data from Glassfish and then it kills the uh, uh, current timer and starts a new one. So there is a method timer service dot uh, cancel so you can cancel the timer. And what we did a few years ago, but it was already Java, Java 6, we made a schedule expression injectable so we could inject um, schedule expression which was depending on the class. So, um, so what you can do then you can start the whole schedule expression. So schedule expression is basically a POJO with some, you know, um, attributes. So you can store it in a database table, and then you get, uh, then you get a job framework, a job scheduling framework. And this is what we actually did. So we implemented a proof of concept in a, in a few hours, so it worked perfectly. So it's absolutely possible to in, to to use uh, to implement uh, configurable timers. So uh, it would be actually fun for open source project, but you know just additional open source project just to, to configure timers. And it's very easy to implement. Um, okay. So this is the question number 13 is the same. There is the same answer. Um, um, question number 14, John Hogan. Um, what I usually do, I always mention during conferences or whatever, I like monolithic applications. And uh, then I had some uh, talks about microservices and someone asked me, you know, how it is <laughs> compatible. So sometimes I talk about monolith and sometimes I talk about microservice. Am I crazy or what? So this is basically the question. And um, the answer is um, nothing actually changed. So what I always uh, said, ho hopefully, is the following. So um, if you have a war um, or, or start with the application, think about business logic and create a monolithic war first. If you are lucky, you're basically done. If you, are, uh, if you are a member of a larger project or whatever, you have uh, multiple teams and, and they have um, you know, different life cycles, or life cycle means um, 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 they, they push the uh, application, parts of the application to, um, to uh, deployment at uh, different schedules, different dates or whatever, then you have to, set, to create, then you are forced to create multiple wars and and the wars have to communicate with each other usually you would use JAXRS and not soap or a corba so JAXRS because you no know, monolith for me means um, monolith is completely independent from the other monolith so we have two monoliths but they have to be independent how to achieve this the best way to achieve that is with JAXRS so um and uh, then we then then we are talking about microservices so what it actually means in Java 7, you get, or Java 6, you get microservices um, as a side product because, you know, if you have to grow, you have to introduce more wars and the wars are deployed on, 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 on standalone domains in usually right now in some projects in the Docker containers. And so we have the, all the cool stuff everyone is talking about and these are actually microservices. Okay, I hope. I clarified this. If not, um, there, I think I spent more time on DevOps this year to talk about uh, microservices. REST is stateless. Uh, some are claiming that you should not even keep any client state on the server. Yes, this was always true. So I think, I, I, as far as I remember, I delivered a workshop. It was before 2003. And the problem back then was the architect forbid the developers to, to have state in their applications or stateful session beans were forbidden. So they were only able to use stateless beans. The problem is they needed state. <laughs> and, and to implement this, they um, in the stateless session bean, they relied on a singleton with a hash map and they passed a session ID back and forth. So from the outside, the application was stateless and they implemented stateful session bean with a stateless session bean, which is actually allowed, but stateful session bean weren't. <laughs> it was a nice situation. And why I try to help them is because they get, of course, memory, leak, uh, memory leaks with the singleton <laughs> because it was not as well as implemented as stateful session means. So, um, yes, um, I would say um, it, it is not bad, you know, to start with stateless um, applications. If you are uh, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Twitter, Facebook or whatever, it is a very good idea to be stateless. But in, in typical enterprise applications, if you only have to serve to a few hundred, you know, clients, uh, um, you can you can you can use perfectly well stateful applications. Um, usually, um, um, you you can have several thousands uh, sessions without any problems on a mid-range server, so it should work out of the box. 
and doesn't mean that each re request should contain a reference or concrete information about user credential or whatever. Yes, it usually has to mean this. So either the data is stored on the client or in the database. This is what stateless means, but not on the application server. So either you the database on the in the um, the status in the database or on the client, and um, sometimes in the grid. So what you can also do uh, do you can use you no know, Hazelcast, but this is I mean very similar to session replication, uh, or you can store the data in CDN or whatever, but not on the application server. So the next uh, question number 16 is already what we actually talk a lot about is how you would implement a, a user authentication with UI based on a pure RESTful API uh, with tokens. Actually, the first idea would be like servlets, use this word star. So yeah, we we'll just use straight Java E uh, authentication. Uh, and, and, and if it doesn't work, then I would think about tokens or whatever. In a project last year, we used tokens because the tokens were stored uh, on the host, AS400. So we had to use tokens, but uh, we didn't use uh, J2E security um, um, at all. It was just uh, implemented entirely in the database. In all other cases, we just use JAXRS as as if it were a straight servlet. So there is actually no difference to this. Um, how to pass and maintain tokens and invalidate sessions without keeping client state on the server? Um, I mean, if you are SSL, if you have secure communication, which I think you have, uh, it is stateful anyway. So uh, I would say SSL is stateful, so that you have to communicate with the server because the client connects to, to, a, to, 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 to a server, to a particular server, and usually this uh, token can be reused. Oh, yeah, this is what stays with, uh, with HTTPS. So the answer would be just use uh, Java e security straight, so the servlet security also for JAXRS. And if this doesn't work, um, it is also mentioned OAuth. There are lots of OAuth implementations. So um, uh, I think the um, Jersey is using OAuth. There is also a project called Porcupine. It's actually also funny because I created project Porcupine, Porcupine, and uh, GitHub. And you will see there are actually two projects. And I think I just tweeted about this. This is my project and this one. It is, um, interestingly enough, a REST security for JAXRS uh, implemented with Java 7 and Whitefly. And uh, I was just pinged by the uh, committee of the project. It's all uh, for Java 7. I, um, I, didn't, I do not know nothing about the project, but uh, the author pinged me and uh, looks interesting. So I will probably look at this, but it seems like it implements uh, OAuth too. So look at this. Um, okay. So transactions over REST API calls, I would say is a really bad idea because transactions in distributed systems are, are always a bad idea. And um, this is actually the, the, the first I would say the, 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 the first hour, I think, in our architecture course in Munich Airport. So we talk about the CAP theorem, so CAP, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. And then you can actually prove that um, if your system is distributed, you can be either consistent or scalable, but never both. And, um, and, um, and regardless which protocol you're using, whether you're using SOAP or WS transactions or COBA transactions or whatever, even two-phase commit is not bulletproof, of course. So it's always a, a bad idea. So what you will have to do uh, instead, um, you will have to implement a REST in idempotent way. So it means uh, you can repeat the requests without side effects. So usually you can use NUNS for this. Or uh, yeah, this is uh, NUNS. So there is an... ID which never repeats and you send the ID along with the request and the server stores all the IDs in memory if it um, if it um, and, and compares you know the current ID with uh, the known session IDs and if it repeats and we just drops the request so forgets about the request this this could be one and the other one is uh, what just look at Hornet Q REST examples so this is also a, a beautiful example so what happens is you are posting a GMS message and the server sends you back an URI with a uh, unique ID and the URI with the unique ID uh, has to be used for the subsequent request. So this is also why it is idempotent and um, and um, and uh, if you don't use the, uh, the, the URI, the request is going to be dropped. 
So, um, and the problem is what happens if nothing happens, right? It would mean we have uh, uh, two services. Let's say the, the classic one is hotel booking and flight booking. And of course, you would like if you have the flight, um, you would have to room and this is a the classic problem. So um, how to solve the problem? You can only solve it by business. So what it means is uh, you, you have to arrange uh, um, a business API and enhance the business API and say, OK, um, I can cancel the room. So this is the business rollback, but you cannot roll back the transactions. You can roll back the, uh, the business transaction. This is, I think, the best way to deal with something like this. The next one is um, interesting. So this is actually one of the AHEX attendees, and he wrote me a couple of emails. I have really no time to answer this, but I will uh, answer it on, on the AHEX. And it's a composite key, and the composite key and the uh, composite key does not work if the columns are nulls. Some of the columns are null. Why is the case? And this is a really interesting case. And I, um, I, I searched for the, uh, I thought there's something in the spec which prevents this. But actually, a null is not equals null in the database. So the problem is if you have a composite key with null columns, it is really depending on the database. It depends on the database whether you can find anything if one of the columns is null. And I think this is the main problem behind. Uh, um, and didn't found any any uh, mentioning of not null composite keys. So from the JPA perspective, it seems to be valid. From the SQL and database perspective, uh, this is more problematic. So uh, the next question, how could you structure your web application to keep one code base for several customers, each with their own customization? Um, so this is always a problem. So what I would do is I just copy and paste the, the whole thing and then over time find the right abstractions and abstract them um, or just keep copies of this. This really depends how many customers do you have. And uh, what I wouldn't try to attempt to do is to create a framework from right from the beginning because usually you, you don't you know too little about the business domain to, to find the right abstractions. So. Um, and you know the, the question is a little bit too, too too general, but usually one copy is okay. So keep them separate per customer, then see what it is actually worth. You know to, to generalize something, because if you do make everything abstract, you get just another additional you know um, enterprise framework, which is crazy complex and 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 cannot be used by no one uh, but but the author. So um, this is what I would say, and um, of course um, if there is something in common, I will try to extract services like JAXRS services, and then you will get microservices for free. So I would prefer to use JAXRS communication over shared classes. It's of course, it really depends what it is, right? If there are just JPA entities, uh, it's a really bad idea to, uh, to to create for each entity a JAXRS service. But um, uh, I, I would try to, be, uh, to, to create courses services and then expose them uh, via JAXRS. But again, the question is too general. And, and my answer is also too general, but um, and I, I never try to, to find the right abstraction from the beginning. So this is, um, I hope, um, clear. And I think we got some additional questions in the comments, but um, I would say um, I would just overflow them to the, th uh, to the 13th edition of, of, of AirHacks um, because there are uh, multiple questions in the comments and some questions in the gist. gist. And uh, yeah, we are almost one hour, so um, uh, it's going to be too long. So, um, and by the way, what's also interesting because I see it, I um, performed the first interview with a start startup called Tipic, uh, Tipic Camp, and it was actually a very, very, what surprised me, a very, very uh, popular. So I got um, about 6,000 views in two days or something. So um, for, for a single article, it's a lot, um, at least in my blog. And... Um, and um, I, there are several uh, uh, more uh, interviews in the pipeline. If you are involved in a Lean Java 7 project um, or Java 6, Java 7 project or Java E projects or an, a startup, think about this and drop me a tweet or whatever. Um, if you like, I could interview to you as well. Okay. So uh, thank you for watching and see you on upcoming uh, conferences, workshops. So um, there are uh, multiple workshops and I got an idea. Oh, this could just as um, this is very new. Building Java e apps from scratch. This was actually requested by several uh, AirHacks attendees. And they um, and what what I try to do, this is inversion of control. So we will think about an Java e ap uh, application altogether. 
and then I will co uh, let to code you the app and I will just help you with questions. So I will go around the whole time. I, I, I won't code at all. I will just try to find errors in your code and help you to implement the application. You can ask me question and on if and I will try to challenge you. So this was um, um, the idea of the new workshop. Just one day and um, the uh, the problem is uh, <laughs> I had uh, no time, so I just shortened the workshops. But uh, there were so many requests for the testing one, so there was uh, one you know standalone testing workshop in Java. So it was um, in the past also very popular. So uh, thank you for watching and um, see you soon. And um, some questions are overflown to um, to the 13th edition of Ehexo. Thank you and bye.